at the same time. Yes, yes. I, I was having, I was looking into it as I started looking into it oh, yeah. today itself. So, so I'll, I'll get back to you on certain stuff because, cool. because I, I wanted to be like sort of a standalone thing where the person doesn't need to go to a console and uh, fetch yeah, their exactly. keys and all. So, so in that case, uh, how would we be able to ship this? I have to read all the stuff that you shared. Like, it fits, yeah, read through uh, what I said, and and then I think you'll find that like a GitHub Actions workflow will probably be sufficient because you could go and you could make it on a cron job for always like a you know a recurring meeting, or you could make it a triggerable workflow. In which case, then it would just run in the GitHub Actions, you know, on demand whenever you hit hit a button, right? And that way you maintain no yes. infrastructure, which is yes, always fun. Yes, yes, that also sounds good. Yeah. So, so that the most of the part about like recording and uh, interacting with JavaScript would be done with a, a standalone Selenium Docker, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I, I yeah. actually took took a look at your project, but just couldn't dig, dig deep into it that much. Yeah. So, so that was that was uh, that was. I, I don't think I knew about Selenium then or whether it might have been a long time. That was done a long time ago. So basically what I did was I just clicked with PyAuto GUI around the screen. Um, very sort of basic way of doing that. And, yeah, and but, but that was, you know, sort of uh, unreliable because what exactly. happens is uh, the, the resolution at which we are May may differ in different exactly in exactly yeah so something like selenium or, or playwright would be a better option there yes. um but yeah i think so actually i have had experience with uh, selenium because because that's how i started learning python so, oh cool cool so for a year i actually wrote scrappers as an internship from the first internship i almost oh, nice. wrote a lot of scrappers and stuff so i i'm you know, I have idea of XPath and stuff, how we can do Okay, that great, great. Yeah, that's great. And so do you also get recording for free with Selenium? Like, uh, I haven't tried screen? recording because okay. uh, recording recording is not the part of Scrapers generally. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, I think you can do, so the, the, so yeah, you could automate with Selenium and if Selenium doesn't provide recording, then that VNC session is a, is a quick hacky way to get recording. And I think that, you know, you can do stream to stream with FMPEG. Um, and that way you don't have any files sitting around on the disk and it's immediate. Um, and so you, you basically have, you set the VNC as the input and then you set the, you know, YouTube upload URL. They have a thing uh, as the output and, and it should just do stream to stream. Um, now, you know, getting FMPEG to do things is, <laughs> um, you know, not easy, but hopefully, you know. Yes, but, but it is pretty, pretty optimized. Like it yeah, exactly. Like I mean, FMPEG is the way to go if you're doing in, any sort of video stuff. Um, so, so in, in one of my projects, I have set, set up, uh, I have set up uh, RTMP streaming. Yeah. From a private, private in, in, inside a private network, so I guess I must be able to like deal with FFmpeg that that. Perfect. Yeah. So you would be that. That would be good then. Yeah. So you've got some experience doing it. So getting getting down to the FFML stuff, it looks like uh, there are three people. Oh, it, Do we it, have it's, people it's, waiting? No, that's that's just your your presentation and you was counting to three. Uh, wait. Um, are you talking about this or are you talking about last week's notes? So here's what I wanted to do today. I wanted to talk about, you know, I wanted to do some PR review like we talked about. And then I also wanted to talk, so I didn't get to the, I wasn't able to get to doing the issues. I saw that Hashim had commented back. I saw that you did a PR and then, okay, great. And then Hashim had commented back in the one on the list stuff. I don't know if that's enough information though. Um, let's see, where did it go? Hashim was asking, that he could pick it up or not like if i was working oh he, he was asking so 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 actually i said that yeah, I he think... would pick it up okay great okay 
Um, so he's going to do it. Okay, oh yeah, if you're not working with it, I can do it. Okay, I see. Okay, I missed that last sentence. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think let's just say Python. Uh, and this ends up being like... Or a list of lists. Let's see, what would we do here? Yeah, we would want to do... And then we have essentially our features map. Um, so, model. So recently I was like going through the Neo Vim part. I, I shared yeah. that project, right? Yeah. So, so they have this uh, uh, logo designed by Jason Long, and uh, I may be pronouncing his name wrong, but <laughs> the the whole idea here is that uh, we can maybe we can approach him because he seems to be very active on GitHub. Uh, sorry, you're cutting you're cutting out a little bit. Okay, maybe my volume's low. Could you say that again? I, I was saying that their logo design for NeoVim was done by a guy, uh, Jason Long. Oh, okay. And uh, he, he seems to be pretty active on GitHub, so can we approach him for our logo design? Uh, for what design? Logo? For our logo design, for DFML logo design. Oh, yeah, I mean, sure, I mean, sure, I, I'm, I'm, I'm open to whatever, right? I mean, obviously we don't have any, like, like... I mean, like, are you going to ask him, like, you, like, we're thinking about paying him to do it, like, in relation to the funding issue, or to see if he'll do it pro bono, or, like, what are you, what are you thinking? Because I know you I said think, that, like, he, he might be uh, into community stuff, and he might not, like, uh, give us a quotation for it, like, like he okay. might do it as a pro bono. Cool, cool, okay. So, let's see when we write So, that. I just wanted to, like, make sure, so shall, shall we, like, pro contact him. I have added his uh, link to his uh, profile in the issue. I haven't tagged him. Okay, there. let's see. Let me open the logo issue. And from active, I mean really, really active. Yeah, I mean, uh, let's see. Jason Long. Okay. That's funny. Uh, let's see. Work at GitHub. No thanks, girl. Cool. So he does. Let's see. No, 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 no. The replacement icon. Figma plugin. All right. Yeah. So he's very much a. Uh, uh, logos for open source projects. Cool. Okay. Let me paste this in as well. So I just wanted to ask you, like, uh, I just don't go and like approach people with the, the name of DFML. It might be not right in some way, which I am not able to see. Oh so yeah, no. First I mean, go through you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You never know what the Intel stuff, right? Yeah. Thanks for checking in. Um, you know, I don't think, I think that, uh, I think that, um. I knew this looked familiar. Okay, wait a minute. Yeah, I knew. I was like looking at this, and I was like, this looks vaguely familiar, and that's where it looks familiar from. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I would say, yeah, if you want to approach them, go go for it. Um, you know, uh, I don't, I think, you know, we might need to give them, I don't know what we would give them as sort of inspiration, you know, like the doc site, I'm not sure if that sort of gives, gives enough, uh, gives enough inspiration to know what might be a good logo, you know, um, you know what I mean? Yes, he, he doesn't know what the project is about. Actually. Yeah, yes, so maybe. Use the product. Yeah, so maybe we need to do like, how, what would we, what would we say, you know, that could that somebody could make a logo out of, like, um, mm, let's see. Yeah, I mean, in the, at the the core of the project is really let's let's double check that the about page says what the hell we're supposed to be doing here. Uh, <laughs> so let's see. So. Yeah, it makes it easy to generate data sets, train and use machine learning models and integrate machine learning into new or existing applications. Provides APIs for data set generation, storage and model definition. Yeah, I wonder how one, I wonder if this is sort of enough information for somebody to make. Um, what I think a logo. precise statement about DFFML is like we use data flows as our core idea for everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we wrap everything around that, so so this could be. I, I'll come up with some some sort of you know a, a explanation sort of thing or an introduction sort of thing. Yeah. That captures the essence of the project, and I'll share it with you, and I'll share it with him. Okay. That so let's great. let's just first yeah. ask him like he if he'd be able to do it, and if yes, how? Uh, yeah. Or what would it be like a pro bono or or a paid paid? Task? Yeah. What's the deal? Yeah. Yeah, does he? Yeah, because obviously he's he's good, so that would be great. Good, good job, good thinking. Um, so let's see. Uh, so. So while we are on the documentation part, I, I wanted to point out that uh, that the API heading has been blown up from a long time. Like, yeah. We and need to. There's all this file, and I don't know what's wrong because those files are not tracked. So it's yeah. difficult to know what, what actually went wrong because yeah. th those are made. Those yep. are not. Uh, so let's yeah. check out docs. Okay, so let's just look at docs. Let me let me finish writing this. Okay, so uh, you will. Mm -hmm. um, what is this client scale now? I want to know what this. Okay, debate database. Okay. Um, okay, I don't need that. Okay, and okay. And, we're going to cover that. So let me just add this pull request to our agenda. Okay, and you know, becomes okay. and that's this. Okay, so come over to some of this that talks about ah why is it laggy? How uh, data flows are our central concept. Okay. And then how's it going, Hashim? Yeah, it's going good. How about you? Good, good. So, uh, and send, ask if he'd be willing to make us a logo. Okay, cool. Um, and then what else would we say? So, I just want to make sure we got everything down that we just talked about. So, and then we're going to review this. Um, Download, loading, fix, and ooh, oh, the there, API there, docs. There is, there is a pending PR which we were to review, like as a yeah. sample review. 
that was about source and Excel source. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we can do that one today. Um, that way, because we said we were going to do one of the one of the PRs. So. Okay. Other than that, I, I also responded on the infra stuff, infra funding stuff. I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. Let's see. Um, let me just put infra funding. Uh, and let me just put the link so that we. I mean, I, I responded after you responded. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I saw that. Let's see, where did it go? Um, okay, so. Let me just link to this. This way we just capture, you know, the stuff that's happened that we're talking about. Okay. So, okay. Um, wow. My computer is really being laggy today. All right, so uh, API docs are still out of sync. Um, and, okay, so. Other than that, we need to discuss that model expose more information issue, yes. double one, four, three. Great, thank you. Okay, so exposing more information about models. All right. Um, one, four, three. Oh, is it one, four, three or one, one, four, three? I bet it's one, one. Yes, it is double one, four, three. Okay, great. Okay. I was like, I don't think that's been around for that long. Um, Okay, so let's see. So, uh, okay, so we'll talk about this. We'll go over that. We'll do that PR review. Uh, we'll do this PR review. Um, and so then, Hashim, so do you, what, what would you like to talk about today? Uh, yeah, so I just saw your comment on uh, 1222. 1222. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about. Uh, the list you paste there. Okay, let's see. Um, so, okay, so uh, model accept list as input. All right. I think it's 12.22. Oh, 12.22, my bad. Man, I wish there was something I could take notes in an automated way. Okay, so 12.22. Okay, so this should be quick. So basically, what I was saying here is you know, this will be equivalent to, or okay, will be equivalent to the above line below will be equivalent to the, li to the line above after this PR. Oh, okay. Uh, the brackets confused me. Yeah, sorry. I was worried about that. I was like, oh, no, I forgot. Um, but yeah, so basically, you know, like you got it right, you know, map the features um, and then just create dictionaries. And I think that, yeah. that ends up in diff well, util internal um, records to sources. Uh, yeah, so basically this here will become, you know, if list and then look at model features, although you don't have model. So... Yeah, uh, I'm actually working on it currently. Uh, yeah. uh, I've created another helper function to convert record lists to dictionaries oh, in, the, in this same file. Perfect. Yeah. Great. And we'll be calling it before uh, we call records to sources because uh, that's also being called uh, from sources itself. Okay. Okay, great. Um, okay, perfect. Um, okay, so... All right, we're good on that then, so. Okay. Uh, anything else you wanted to talk about? 
um, uh, not really. Did you uh, go through the videos? I did. Yes, I did. And I posted them on, um, where did they go? So I should post them. They are in the notebooks. Yes, they're in the notebooks. Okay, they should have an arrow sign over them, I'm realizing now. I thought they defaulted to have an arrow sign over them. Okay, huh. Um, okay. Yeah, and then this one, you know, I put this... Wait a minute, why aren't we there? Um, I put this one on this page because it was... Wait, wait. Uh, notebooks. I put this one on this... So we need an arrow sign above this because this is not clear that this is a video. Or, well, it says video. Um, do they render here? No, we didn't have one for this. Is that right? Wait a minute. This. I think there's two that we don't have. Yeah. Okay. Tuning models. Okay. Um, yeah, we need a little plate. Why are they showing up like this? I feel like YouTube never shows up like this. Okay. I must have grabbed the wrong JPEG. Um, but yeah, so the videos are there. They're not obvious that they're videos. Um, let's see. I need to be more obviously videos okay nice work on those let's see um okay great um and then yeah i think i added the you know the other ones that were non uh, where are they they're also on youtube under the yeah, I saw them on YouTube. Okay, great. Um, yeah, okay. Also, well, uh, could you uh, provide the um, the link to uh, the video that explains the starting process? Uh, because I speak of it in the start of every video. Okay, let's see. So we should probably put the we should probably put that in the description of each video, then, right? That's yeah. what you're saying. Okay. Okay, so let me add that, uh, that note. So, yeah, that's why I put it at the top of that thing, but that's, yeah, we probably need to put it in the description. I forgot about that. Uh, it was um, it was showing up at the bottom of the playlist. I don't know why. Okay, let's see. So I uh, need to put link to uh, set up video in top of description of each uh, notebook use case. Use case video. Okay, great. Um, anything else on that notes-wise? No, that's it. Okay, great, great. Um, let's see, so, okay. All right, so videos. Okay, second party. Okay, so second party plugins. So let's look at what else we have. So what do we need to cover? Um, done, uh, not done, not done, uh, not done, done, okay, PR review, not done, done, okay, great, um, all right, so I need to talk to you guys a little bit about the second party plugin stuff. So basically, this is like uh, my number one thing that I have to do right now. Um, so uh, someone's coming around and auditing things. Um, and so um, well, we may or may not be uh, in compliance for an audit. So basically, I need to put my ass in high gear and uh, make sure that this second party plugin thing is, is, is uh, happening. Um, so what that's going to mean is basically we're going to end up splitting out all of the, um, the non core stuff into the DFML org. Um, so, uh, just so you guys know, I basically, I have to basically be heads down on this until that's done. Um, and I'm trying to make that done like, you know, yesterday. So, uh, I was working all weekend on it and, and, uh, this is sort of what, what, what I'm up to. Um, <laughs> Uh, just so you guys know. And so basically what that ends up being is I need to still update this architecture document. But 
um, just as a refresher, the main issue that we ran into this when we were trying to design this second party plugin thing was the documentation and how do you validate the documentation? Um, you know, because we have docs that use multiple plugins. Um, so, uh, so yeah. can't we like just link those, like have separate documentation for each plugin and it would be linked in the central. Uh, so, like second party plugins, we can like manually link them. Um, a lot, lot of projects do this. Like, what are you test, saying? For example, PyTest, there are some some uh, popular extensions which are used with PyTest. So, they just link to those documentations and then those documentations for those plugins are built separately. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That is what will happen. Yeah. Um, so the, the main thing, it really has to do with more of the, the issue was really around testing um, and how do you ensure that uh, breaking changes, that you're aware of breaking changes in uh, so d uh, downstream repos. So basically anything that sees, for example, config uh, YAML, the config YAML plugin is a dependency of many other uh, plugins, right? Um, and so if we make a change in config YAML, we need to know every plugin and every tutorial that might, you know, be affected by that change and we need to revalidate. Um, so basically, so, yeah. So I'm not able to grasp the complexity here. Like, uh, what, 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 what is that uh, we have issue with? Because, uh, for example, uh, let's treat these all packages as standalone packages like we have. So we don't care about how other packages work. We just care about that the version we have in our system works with our system. So each package, each plugin would be itself an independent project. Yes. And if one breaks, then we'll fix it. And, uh, yes, and we have to know that it's broken, though, is the thing. Um, yes, that, that's, that's the main thing. It's how do we figure out that it's broken, right? And that's where the complexity gets involved here. Um, and so essentially... So essentially what will end up happening is, okay, so you say you have, this is, I'll write it in the ADR, I'll write it in the ADR and we'll talk about it next week. Um, but that's, that's exactly where the complexity comes in is, okay, how do you, how do you know that things are broken? Um, this, uh, and basically the CI, you know, how, how do we, how do we make the CI so that it, it can revalidate, um, through the dependency tree of our plugins um, to make sure all of our plugins work um, and work according to the support levels that we've defined. Um, so basically what ends up happening is, is it, at least the way that I've, I'm going to write it up here is, and, and that's why I'm bringing it up. So if you guys see any holes in this logic, let me know right now. So if we, so you bring up a PR, right? So you bring up a PR to say the config YAML library, right? Now, you need to, that, that pull request needs to be validated against anything that uses config YAML to make sure that you're not, you know, because if all of a sudden you actually start not serializing to YAML, everything else is going to break, right? So we need to trigger the, we need to trigger a rerun of the downstream plugin. So for example, say, uh, what tutorial? Say like the NLP tutorial. Um, which resides within the NLP, um, you know, operations uh, repo that that uses config YAML, right? Um, so we need to trigger a retest of that tutorial on a PR change to config YAML, right? Because that is currently so that's currently ha what happens in our CI because we have a mono repo, right? So we need to figure out the what I've done is I've sort of said we any the, every plugin needs to declare all of its dependencies right obviously um and if those one of those dependencies is a plugin then and you've changed that plugin you know then we need to revalidate anything you know that might be using that changed plugin um so what it amounts to is basically just kicking off the github actions workflow run um on demand and then reporting back the status into the repo where the pr originally occurred um does that does that make sense or mm, yes, see yes, any so issues so with a, that a, a, a very very simple and maybe incorrect 
solution comes to mind that uh, it, with all the dependencies we have that are internal dependencies like the dfml package itself and the uh, plugins we always used the most up to date version like the pip install dash u sort of stuff and uh, run the test periodically on like 12 am or something and we will uh, know in a day or two if we make break something well, see, and that's what I want to avoid. I don't want to know in a day or two, right? I want to know when the PR gets put up, right? Because some of these things could be, for example, if you introduced, okay, so we now have all these, the accuracy score everywhere, right? So for example, if you introduced a change to the required config of the MSE accuracy store, score, you would trigger failures in, I bet, you know, a lot of the CI jobs, right? Because they're all using the MSE accuracy score right now. I'm pretty well, most of them, right? And so you introduce a new required command line flag or config option, and, and it'll break them all, right? And so we that 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 approach that approach it's a solid approach, right? But you ideally would find out before you merge the PR, right? And so then you get into the complexity of okay, well. <laughs> now and then this is where it gets annoying so now we have we're saying basically you're testing against master right okay well now what if i'm going to need to make a pr in the downstream repo to address the new like the, the to address the breaking api change right and so when you do that um when you do that you're going to need to sort of re yeah is this the uh github actions yeah um so when you do that you're going to need to say okay so so say you made a you made a breaking api change right i have to change the documentation so that it um so that it um uh you know uses the new command line flag well now i essentially need to maintain either i need to maintain two versions of the documentation or I need to maintain a version within the same document. I need to maintain different commands for different versions of the um, of the um, the dependency, right? Um, and so this is this is obviously this is not ideal, but this allows no, no, no. it allows documentation you, should be synchronous, otherwise it will be a big mess. Yeah, well, so the thing is, you have to figure out how are you going to, so so then if you don't do it this way, then how are you going to result in a non, like, how do you result in a clean CI job? You see what I'm saying? So basically, and then, okay, so then here's the next thing that happens. And I'll write, so I'll write this up, but I just wanted to explain it first. So you specify the so now you've you've broken downstream right so now you need to go to downstream and you need to update the documentation of downstream to be you know what what it should be for the new or no maybe we got rid of, i think i actually maybe i got rid of that change in the documentation thing you know, i remember what that was related to okay so you update the documentation right so now the documentation is that pull request in the downstream repo is valid only if the pull request in the upstream repo is merged right or in in the dependency rep or in the yeah you know what i'm saying um in the the original pr only if the original is pr is merged so then essentially what you end up with is okay before you merge that pr yeah, no, the versions of the things, that was a different thing. Sorry, I got streams crossed there. Um, the You need, essentially, then you end up with this locking mechanism that happens where you, um, so GitHub has this thing where you can enable automatic merging of a PR when all the pr approvals are met. So if you have, so all the CI passes on these both these PRs, right? Um, so you have the one in the the you know in the the dependency, and then you have the uh, one farther downstream, you know, the dependent uh, repo, uh, where you've changed the documentation in accordance with the API breaking change. So 
now your job is valid. Your valid in, your job in upstream is valid if you use the upstream P, if you apply the PR upstream PR when you're doing the downstream CI validation of that documentation. Then you need, but you need both of those things to go through at the same time, or else the whole thing there else you end up in a, in a broken state right so this is where the locking comes in so essentially you end up you could have a bot that sits there and says okay status checks pass right and approvers you know and, and the approvers have given their approval right so now merge uh almost like a domino merge from downstream back to upstream so trigger the the merge in the um in the downstream repo, so the one where we made the documentation change, so do the do the merge, and then that CI job. So when that CI job kicks off, it's going to need in it some information that says don't run until the upstream has hit, you know, has has merged that plugin. So just in the event of a race condition there, so that you merge the downstream, then you merge the upstream, right? Both the CI jobs kick off, and now you end up with a clean uh, a clean job on master. Um, questions, comments, concerns? I know it's complicated, but it preserves. Yeah, it's complicated. Yeah. Something like to read would be uh, much better. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna put it in, in docs form. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I just I needed to tell you guys because I'm, this is, uh, yeah. yeah I I, it. it's, it's not that simple. It's, it's going to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've been. I mean, I looked at this thing and I realized we've been mulling this over since April um, on how we're going to do this. Uh, and and then yeah, they started. I got an email saying another project's getting audited, so I'm about to put my ass in high gear here. Um, so um, yeah, so just so you guys know, that's coming. Um, and uh, I think what we'll end up with is also. Oh, so the tutorial thing. Now I remember what that was about. So basically, the different versions of things. Um, because we're going to end up with, um, this is, I think this is, this was more, and this is why I haven't written it down yet, but I think this is more related to these support levels because the end users care, you know, the, some end users might only want to use DFML for a specific use case, right? And for them, you know, say maybe they wanted to use the transformers code, which we had to take out, right? Well, they might be okay just using an old version of DFFML because they want to use transformers, in which case it would be nice if there was some command where they could say, check if my installed, you know, my installed environment, right? All the packages and all the versions that I have right now are compatible with this tutorial. Um, and this would prevent people from not understanding why things aren't working. Um, so basically with the tutorials, when we build the doc site, we would log information that says these are the versions of these plugins that are used in the tutorial that we tested this tutorial against. And that way, users could run some command that goes and parses maybe some block out of the tutorial and tells them, hey, yes, you're running the version, the same version of DFFML and the same version of all these plugins that um, you know the tutorial assumes that you're going to be running. Um, and what was about the... I don't, maybe maybe that thing with the docs, I think I might have thrown away. I have a bunch of notes on my phone that I'm trying to type into here. I think that might have been an old version because, yeah, that that is not, it doesn't end up being, that, that ends up being a disaster. <laughs> Anyways, so, uh, okay, so that was that. Um, so then we wanted to, I just want to let you guys know that I have to do that and that's what's going to, it's going to be a, a giant sort of CI thing. Um, but I think it'll, it'll end up being, a, it'll end up being manageable. So cache download logging. Um, so API docs are still out of sync. Uh, let's see. Why don't we look at the API docs first? Um, so docs, API index. Okay. Max step to glob. Okay. Okay. So what do we got here? Okay, it looks like things are being put into, let's see, config loader do, do we actually, no, we actually just have this much code. Okay, um, yeah, feature, feature, high level, 
Beautiful. High level. Okay, we have a high level dot RST and a high level. Okay, so maybe this is part of what's going on. Let's see. No async. Okay. CLI, CLI. Does, uh, did you get the chance to look into this at all? Um, so that just in case I'm missing something that you may already have seen. No, uh, maybe, maybe Hashim has taken a look at it because he was earlier working on it. He may be able to tell something. Did you, did you, because uh, yeah, right now this is a mystery. If anybody knows anything, then we can start with hint wise. <laughs> uh, I do know one thing that is uh, we do get a warning about missing a container while we build the docs. If you just like go with DFF mandatory docs, you'll see that it happens. Okay, let's build a docs. Okay, missing a container. I I honestly don't remember anything about it. Yeah, it's been a while. So I yeah I I, I understand. Um, let's see. When would I think this bug? I think we introduced this when we went. What what when did we introduce this? Let's see. We introduced this probably after 1054. I have mentioned where it was introduced in the comment. Okay, so. great. Um, in the comment. Okay, so. But, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But this is uh, basically the same thing, so why? <laughs> ah, I looked at this and I was like, this doesn't make any sense. This should be the same thing. Um, let's see. So. So a while ago, I looked at uh, this. I was looking into the uh, second party plugin stuff, and I mm -hmm. thought that we might need a good package manager of our own mm -hmm. because that would like solve a lot of problems while installing stuff. And I, I found a paper. I'll share it on GitHub. Okay. Let's see. So, you know, I think maybe we should just do this one offline um, because, uh, because yes, this, this is kind of kind of like, the needle in history. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think one of us will tackle this offline. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to look at this. Why don't I look at this? Because uh, if I do the second party stuff, well, is that even related to the second party stuff? I don't know. We'll just leave it up there. The the main thing is we'll we'll fix it before beta. Um, um or before our next release you know whatever our next release is that one definitely has to be in there so okay so let's just say um uh, my new package manager of our own i'll wait for that link there um and then gonna take this offline or wait where is that uh we'll tackle offline oops haven't Okay, so exposing more information about models. This is probably a good one for us to all talk about since we're here. So what this comes down to is, right, you know, just so we all recap here, but basically, you know, we, we have certain things which would, would like to know something about the models, right? And, and the first thing that comes to mind is maybe like the auto ML stuff, you know, right? It, it might want to know that you might give it a regression a regression problem and, and you know it would like to be able to pick all the applicable you know all the regression models right so it, it could try them right um let's see what model trained not strange okay this is slightly different um so this is about properties and this is maybe another method that we might need to add to the model um so let's see what else did we say so uh what should be the correct Defining the model type should be a property of model, mainly well defining your model class, or should be a config property which is immutable, and we have an exhaustive list of types to choose from. In both cases need an exhaustive set of types. Yeah, I believe we do need an exhaustive set of types. Um, this anytime we need sort of an exhaustive set that usually screams plugin, you know, um, so that we can define more. Um, uh, I thought about the word usage might be a little better, uh, like the model usage, but that might not be the right word either. I've had a hard time trying to figure out what is the name for 
classifier or regressor or, you know clustering like i haven't seen sort of an official name for that you guys might know if there is one um let's see uh oh and then we talked about you know so if it's a plugin it becomes easy to override with config and then there's the question okay i didn't see this great um then there's the question of like scope you know should we be um let's read what you said so uh, numerating types from the types mentioned above, one may be a subtype of the other. For example, NLP and CV models will be classified under classifiers and vice versa. Ah, very, very good point. Models can be classified into supervised and unsupervised classes, regressors, classic models, linear models, you know, some simple symbols, neural network. Anyway, see. Okay, so maybe we need a list of tags. Dot a list of tags or maybe a, you know like a smaller object which holds this information maybe a dictionary something like that. yeah model yeah type a data class would be good but model type model uh you know model type could be regressor and or this and then it could be like uh, domain and uh, yeah associated library or something so maybe this should go in like a model metadata object and the model metadata could be yes that's yeah. what I'm about. okay great yeah so maybe yeah so maybe some kind of model metadata and then the question is where do we put this model metadata so do we make it uh so if we put it in the config we essentially make it overridable right at runtime um you know there's the pros and cons of that is, you know, maybe if some modules implementation could understand that it should be doing one thing based on the other, you know, you could argue, argue also that you should have just written another class for that. Um, so, or we could make it sort of a class scoped variable, right? That's, that's some kind of metadata object, which is probably just, you know, an at config um, with these things defined in it, right? Um, then is there any things that must be declared or might be optional would be a good place to go from there. So what do you guys think? Do, do you think there's value to, should it be a runtime thing or should it be a static thing? It should probably be, it a, should be a static. Yeah, it should probably be a static thing, right? Because you you can't yeah static. You, you can't instantiate it if your if your question is what should I be instantiating it, <laughs> then you can't do it if it's uh, not instantiated yet. So yeah, so let's see, let's write some notes here. Okay, uh, let's make a metadata property, uh, which class scope, are we, sold, are we sold on that? So that would be essentially model.metadata. Does that sound good? Or any, any other suggestions? Yeah, it sounds good. Okay, and I think we might just make this a standard thing across everything else as well. Uh, so blank dot metadata, and it's all, all base configurables. So all base configurables. So model metadata would itself be a class or an object? Would it be? So I would say that. Okay, so let's go look at base configurable. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, we said we were going to tackle this later, but where was this thing about container? Okay, I'm not seeing anything about missing a container. Okay, anyways, we will tackle that later. All right, um, base configurable, df well, base. I cannot wait to real refactor all the stupid config code. Oh my gosh. Uh, God, we have so much config code and it's all just like sweet. It's way not what it should be right now. I think we've we've learned a lot since we've done a first approach at this. Um, so base configurable, right? So this is okay. So base configurable meta class. This is what does our little init stuff, which not love that, but whatever it is, what it is. Um, okay. So open it. Okay, so this would be a good place to validate that there's a meta object. So um, to do validate that class has a metadata property. Okay, 
Um, let's see. And so then what we would do is any instance of base configurable. So in this, every like models and stuff are derived from base configurable. Where is the end of this guy for a second thing? Okay. Or, okay. So base data flow. Let's see. Maybe it should be in base data flow facilitator object because that is a little more scope to what we're doing. Okay, so that context and entry point. Uh, this this stuff should probably be, yeah, okay, they should be in new. Okay, we already said that. Yeah, so basically what we would do is we would say, you know, in these sub subclasses of this thing that I'm writing in right now, we'd say metadata equals, and then probably, you know, model blank model metadata. Okay. But this is, needs to be an instance of something. So is it, it's probably an instance. So we probably have a model metadata object, right? And the model metadata object defines these things, right? And so we'd have model metadata. Um, okay, now I'm going to really screw up all my ability to... Uh, so model metadata, right? So we have, what is this? Um, so, so we'd need some enums too, or no, we, we use enums. Yeah, I think we're gonna just use enums. The problem is what if you add a new one, right? And this is the thing with the plugin. So what if we added, what if we add a new plugin, which needs to be a new model type? Right, then it needs to know, it needs to pick, it needs to be able to dynamically declare its new type so that we don't have to submit a pull request to the main library to add the new type, right? Um, so this needs to be some kind of entry point, this model, so model metadata, okay, so model metadata was supervised or unsupervised, what would we call that? Um, my brain is escaping me right now. Or supervision. Supervision model metadata. Is this a? Are you guys? Are you guys? Do you guys have thoughts on what I'm doing right now? Should I? Should we do this right now? Because I'm just trying to talk and figure out. You know what? What do we end up with here? I think we end up with. You know, each of these properties is an entry point. Right, so supervision model metadata ends up being a base entry point. And then the model metadata itself is some class, right? This is some data class, or like this is some at, it's some data, it's basically a data class. And this is a supervision model metadata. So this is supervision, right? And supervision model metadata base entry point, and then, you know, supervised, we have supervised and unsupervised then, right, which are subclasses of this, right, this is how we have been defining these things, and we could create a shorthand way of doing this, right, like some kind of something something easier than this like sort of like we did entry point right um does this you guys see what i'm saying here does this make sense did i lose you guys um, why 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 we need to have it as a base data point and base entry why, point? why is a base entry point okay so say for example, say NLP CV, right? So say we don't have, um, okay, maybe let me, okay, so, okay, say there's, so we have supervised and unsupervised for supervision, right? Maybe there was partially supervised, right? And say, for example, that we currently have supervised and unsupervised models, right? But somebody invents, you know, in their genius moment, a partially supervised model, you know? for the sake of example right and uh, if they if we had like an enum that declared whether it was supervised or unsupervised 
um, they would have to go and make a pull request to the main DFML library to add the unsupervised enum, right? If, but if we use a, a, a pl the plugin system, they can define a new plugin, which is the partially supervised um, plugin, right? And so if you listed, if you did supervision model metadata.load, you would end up with um, you would end up with a list. Um, you would end up with with this as your return list, right? Um, when they partially supervised supervision model metadata, right? You see what I'm saying? So if you did this, you would end up with this list if they registered their you know, they would register their new partially supervised type, right? And that way you could have another plugin which says, I know how to act on partially supervised models, right? And it knows about this partially supervised model metadata, you know, partially supervised thing. And your model that implemented the partially supervised thing knows about this, but DFML, the main the main library we never have to hear twice about partially supervised because we we don't we're we're just the foundation that connects the other things right so no one has to add any code to the main library to declare uh a new supervision status right they just declare the entry point right and then they end up with that that uh you know they, they end up with that supervision status right does that make sense Yes, yes, that makes sense to me. Okay. Um, and so then this model metadata class really just is, you know, this is just a regular, um, I think this is just an at config basically, because then when we describe the metadata, so if we have, you know, class my model, we would say model, we would say metadata equals, you know, model metadata, and then we would set it up, right? Um, supervision equals, so does this work? Okay, so let's see. I'm not gonna run it, but I'm just gonna think for a second. So supervision equals supervised model data. So now if we called model.load, it was load this, and this has this type loaded. I think this works, I think this works. Any questions, comments, concerns about this approach? Not, I cannot see any issues at this moment, but okay. I'll point them out if I can. Okay, great. So we should write up an ADR for this as well. Um, I mean, what we should write up, what we should do is we should just, where's that issue? So we will turn this, we will probably do the implementation and then turn it into an ADR, right? Um, just so that we, you know, just, you, you, I, don't, I think we're all on the same page here. Like we can write it down afterwards um, because, you know, you um, probably go do it unless you feel like you want to write it up and have more of a defined thing before you start implementing. If I don't really have uh, another approach in my mind, but uh, won't this uh, make it a lot more bulky well, to handle all the types? Uh, well, so yeah, I mean, there's some, there's some bulk involved here now, but keep, but keep in mind, so keep in mind what we did for the, um, um, for where is that stuff? Um, oh, maybe this is, this is probably very deep at this point. Um, data set source. Okay, so basically, yeah, okay, this is probably buried deep. I don't think I ever maybe publicized this, but we came up with this way of sort of defining pre-canned data sets on the fly by using this wrapper. And this wrapper essentially creates a source out of a function. Um, and uh, so basically you could say, you know, you could, you could download your data set and then yield as the source of the correct data type, right? And then 
uh, all you have to do to use it is just say, you know, import my training data set, or you can use it from the command line, you know, as, as you would. Um, so it's just sort of a, when you say dot source, so it's a, it's a shorthand, right, where we can basically take a function and turn a function into an entire source, right? Um, so we eventually, let's see, so, so this is the type of thing that, that, you know, we can create helper functions to make, God damn it. Um, we can create helper functions, which would make uh, defining, for example, I mean, you could say supervision model metadata equals base entry point. Um, okay. Like make base entry point. How would you, you know, I think this is already pretty much as, yeah, this is already pretty, you could, you could make it something like this, right? Um, but, uh, and then you could say, uh, make entry point, you know, I'm just not sure if this is more concise or not. Um, let's see. I don't know if this is, this is, I don't know if this answers your question on bloat though, you know, like, is this what your, is the definition of the plugins like this sort of what you're thinking is kind of bloated? Maybe we could do, oh, maybe we could do something like dfml.enum, entry point enum, entry point dot enum. And then we could say, oh, this is, here we go. Here's a shorthand for this. Now we end up with, ooh, hey, there we go. I like this. Okay, so this could be a way, and then we could say, you know, uh, diffml.model.metadata. So this ends up getting passed to, this ends up getting passed to base entry point. That's a bit, that, this could be a bit more of a shorthand for the sake of maintainability, right? And so we might we might declare some of these in the base package, right? We'll probably declare one set of them in the base package, and this could be, you know, a, a, a nicer way of declaring them. Um, and we could then have this enum thing do, it basically would handle the creation of these classes with the entry point decorators appropriately. Um, supervise, I'm supervise. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Is that kind of what you're talking about when you're talking about bloat? Like, you know, this is just a mess to maintain <laughs> as far as looking yeah. at. Yeah. So yeah. does this look a little better? I mean, I know this isn't great, but yeah, yeah. okay. So let's, let's think about this then. Um, and yeah, so we could, you know, we can start with one and then we can refactor. That could be a fun one to do as a, as a, as a team, like in a meeting sometime, because I think that kind of stuff, um, that, that, that kind of stuff um, can be interesting in terms of like, how do you make a little helper? Um, it can be useful, you know, all the time. So uh, we could make a helper to define essentially an enum for uh, plugins. Yeah, so I don't know. That's not a great description of that. But you, you guys, ah, God, this is the problem with the issues. <laughs> um, okay, should we spend more time on this right now? I don't know if either of you were wanting to commit to pick this up, but this is a little bit more information. If you're if you're not wanting to pick this up, I wasn't assuming that somebody was trying to pick this up right now. But if one of you wants to, great. If not, we can keep sort of talking about it. It might be good to do a little more talking. I think this is pretty much it, though. Like, does that sound good to everybody? Yes, and we are about to get kicked in 10 minutes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, so next topic. Um, so I think, uh, sweet. Um, okay, so let's see. Well, I suck at clicking. Okay. Suppose more info about models. 
Um, and then I'll just say that we did played around. So we played with we experimented with uh, how we should define the metadata. Okay, great. And let's call that done. Um, okay, so what else do we have? So we have the cache download logging fix, PR review. So let's just do PR review real quick because I think I'll probably just, I think I skimmed that um, uh, logging one. So let's see. So because uh, you 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 have seen your own PR Sahil and um, wait now I'm clicking on it I'm clicking all the wrong things okay so let's review this and I'll review yours offline um, or if we get to it somehow for the ten minutes so um, God this is a while back 